you for leading us in worship this morning. Music. I'll be ready to get this boot off. I'm tired of walking in a boot. Every time I go down the steps, I got to be really careful and going up the steps. I'm looking forward to that day where the doctor says, I won't throw it away, but put it in your closet. Got to keep it. The Christian heart has to remain pure and true. I better, uh, I've requ been requested to wear the mic because I get away from the uh, microphone too much, so lapel. People who are listening on the internet should be able to hear me when I get carried away and get adding things, so. Re uh, turn to Matthew chapter 13. Let's reread that. The tares and the wheat. The wheat are those who are living holy, pure. The tares represent kind of a falsehood of living holy. Also, two things that we re need to remember is it's uh, there's the dealing with judgment in here, and uh, that God will speak in here to us about making judgments. So, Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 says, Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the, his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat uh, sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. Verse 27, the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, do you want us to, then to go out and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Verse 30, allow both of them to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat and put them into my barn. Let's go ahead and pray over the word, Lord. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. Help us to fully understand the parable here and how it applies to our lives. And it's just as relevant then as it is today that... We need to understand the truth that is in your word. And these are the words that Jesus spoke to us. And so we want to really definitely uh, open up our hearts to it and receive the truth in it. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said there would be both good and evil people in this world. And they'll be living side by side is basically what's being presented here in the tear or in the uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares, even the church will not be immune to some of that mixture, and we'll have that. And basically, what we're going to be talking about is, um, I guess the word would be hypocrite, uh, two-faced, living two lives, uh, living one way and presenting yourself in another. Uh, anything that would apply that way. And they appeared to look like wheat, but they were tares. And uh, the actual, uh, I guess the word for the tares, or the name of the plant is darnell. And I guess while they're sprouting up, they look identical to the wheat, and they present themselves as part of the wheat, but once the head starts to show uh, of the, or the grain, it has a definite difference as far as being able to distinguish them. 
Let me just uh, kind of give you a little bit of a story. When was the last time you might have heard this conversation like this? I'm going to just use a name. Uh, Betty, how come you never shop at Walmart? And Betty answers, well, I used to. But the last time I was there, the place was just full of hypocrites. So I'll never go back there again. We don't ever hear that, do we? We don't hear that out in the world. But you probably have, if you've invited somebody to church or mentioned that you would like to see somebody come to church, they would say, I don't want to join a bunch of hypocrites. You never hear such conversation about that. Zig Ziglar said that he invited a friend to go to church with him, and the man answered, well, I'd like to go, but the church is so full of hypocrites, and Ziglar replied, that's okay, there's always room for one more. <laughs> Jesus told them this parable, and this parable basically can be laid definitely over the world, that we'll have evil amongst holiness. And also, too, it can apply to the church because we're not immune to it. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the, the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, do you want us? Do you, uh, I thought you sowed good seed in your field. Where then did these weeds come from? The enemy. The enemy is... Satan. Satan. He has a great influence on the world. And there is much evil amongst people who are trying to live holy and pure. And the church needs to stay holy and pure. And we need to live lives that represent what God um, <clears throat> intended for us and wants us to live. Satan is clever. And he wants to split, he wants to destroy, he wants to stop growth. And so there's a little bit of, there's a battle going on of good and evil. If you look there, it said you sowed good seed. So solid teaching and understanding of the word was being given. Uh, it was also good soil because they sprouted and they actually matured. We have to look at that in the parable. And uh, they took root. Also in this parable, uh, most of the emphasis is on towards what will happen to the bad seed. If you look at it, it will be gathered up, it will be bundled, and it will be burned up. And then just a little bit of the portion of the last part of verse 30, it says, but the ga and gather the wheat and put it into my barn and it will be taken care of. In this parable, Jesus says that the wheat and the weeds grow side by side. They look a lot alike, and if we try to pull up the weeds, we would likely uproot the weed as well. So we're told to let them grow until the harvest, and then it will be obviously easier to see, which is what we, it should be obvious that our lives that we're trying to live is holy and pure compared to what's going on out in the world. So <clears throat> notice too that he didn't let the slaves gather up the uh, tares, but he did let the harvesters. And there's a difference there, okay? So let's see what the first thing is here. The presence of hip hypocrisy is definitely out in the world, and we can also find it in the church. The first one is the presence of hip hypocrisy. Jesus says that there will be both good and evil in this world, and they will be living side by side. Even the church will not be immune to this mixture. Uh, on one hand, it seems unfair to say that the church is full of hypocrites because... I know and you know good, holy people that are trying to live a life that is pleasing to God. So when we hear people say it's full of hypocrites, they don't know what they're saying. Because I've lived with you. 
and watched your lives, and you've watched my life. And there's a big difference that when one who is trying to serve the Lord and one who is trying to fake their way through. Uh, But even those of us who have been Christians for many years, we've experienced times when our guard was down, Satan shot his fire arrows at us, and we were fooled. And sin was the result. So are you a hypocrite? So let me explain the difference between a, a Christian and a hypocrite. Let me just start here. Now, there's a difference between Christian struggling with sin and a hypocrite. The Christian struggling with a sin comes to God saying, God, this is a weakness in my life. I really need help from the Holy Spirit to deal with it. And God welcomes that prayer and he promises to help, right? That's a Christian. The one who beat his chest and said, I have sin in my life, I need to go take care of it before I present this offering. There's a parable of that also in the Bible. But the hypocrite doesn't really struggle to overcome his sin. He just tries to hide it. Deep down within the heart, he thinks, when I'm in church or out in the world, I'll behave like a Christian. I'll say the prayers. I'll sing the songs. I'll obey some of the rules. But when I'm out in the world, I'll act no differently and behave the same way the world does. And the flesh is totally in control. That is the difference. The Christian is under the struggle of wanting to be redeemed or forgiven. The hypocrite just hides what he's doing. And so that's the definition that we're looking at this morning. The meaning of hypocrite, this is kind of a little bit of a lesson on this. The meaning of hypocrite originally came from a Greek word Uh, from the uh, drama, uh, the world of drama or acting, one who is play-acting, wearing a mask, the symbol of of Greek drama, as some of you know, is the two-faced mask. Remember when you used to go to the movies and you used to get a box of popcorn? I think actually on the box of popcorn it had two, two masks on the front, and even the tickets had that. And it represented uh, the acting, being two different uh, people, an actor. A preacher in the Midwest tells about a young couple. uh, He told this story. Uh, This couple, must have been years ago, couple was boasting that they were going to go and fly to New York City. I may have told this story one other time. And they were only going to be able to spend one day in New York City But the highlight of their trip would be to go and see a Broadway show. They were so proud of this. They were telling everybody. They must have been from a little small town. And they were saying, we're going to New York and we're going to do some city things. And so everybody was really impressed. No one else in that small town had ever been to a Broadway show. The day came when they arrived in New York. They took the taxi to the theater where the Broadway show that they had been telling everybody Uh, was playing, and to their dismay, they found out the play was completely sold out for the night. They thought, what will we do now? Everybody knows that we came just to see a Broadway show. We don't dare tell them that we didn't go. So they found a couple ticket stubs laying on the ground on the sidewalk, and they picked them up. They went and they bought a program that described the various acts in the play, They went home singing songs from that Broadway show. And everybody, they told, they told that they had went to the Broadway show. The preacher said, that's right. They had the ticket stubs. They had the program. They had been to the theater. And they knew the music. But the trouble is, they didn't see the true performance. And there's people out there the same way. They have the understanding, they have the lingo, they have the talk, and they want to present themselves that they are holy and and living a life of of pureness for the Lord. 
But when they're not in their presence, they're nowhere to be found living that way. And that's the hypocrites. Then he added a lot of Christians are like that. We come to church. We have the bulletin. We, ha we know the songs. We know what to say and do. The problem is that some of us have never really met Jesus and made him Lord of our lives. And I think it's mostly applies to the world, that we live side by side in a world that is uh, <clears throat> a battle going on of there is evil, and then there are those who live amongst those who are trying to live pure lives for the Lord. It's an exhausting thing to try to live two lives. I've tried doing it. When I've been in sin and had things that were in control of my life, acting one way and then doing just the opposite on my own. And to have to pretend constantly that you are someone you aren't. And it drains you of your energy. And that's why many social events are so exhausting. You go to a party, you try to pretend uh, that you're having a good time. When in reality, you just, just rather be at home. But there you are, you're pretending. And before you get home, you're exhausted. And we're living sometimes in a false way, trying to present ourselves as something different. All to falsely maybe elevate ourselves or to fool someone, if you're actually living like a hypocrite. And that's why coming to church, if you truly haven't presented yourself to the Lord, and you're truly not living both in front of uh, the Lord or in front of your brothers and sisters, it gets exhausting trying to live that out, but yet you really want to live like the world does. And it becomes exhausting. If you're play acting, you'll leave here wrung out because you've spent more than an hour of your life pretending to be something that you aren't. It's hard work. Avoiding the question you might not be able to answer in the correct way. It's not only exhausting, but it's also damaging. That when we have uh, impurity within the body, it uh, really speaks out against the gospel as far as presenting it in the right way. Uh, <clears throat> one question that arose in the recent years as the lives of some politicians come under scrutiny was, can someone be one thing in private life and another thing in his public life. And that's a legitimate question. And we see it a lot. But not just in politics, but we also see it in a lot of different people's lives. Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, wrote this. He said, no man for any considerable period can wear one mask to himself and another to the multitudes without finally getting bewildered as to which is the true one. You can get so confused that you're not sure who you are anymore. And there are people out there, and I, I, I know that when you get caught in this, you better keep track of your lies. Because usually, if you have a lie going on, you have to lie to keep that lie going. And it does get exhausting. And people usually forget what they lied about, and they get caught. So it's a dangerous life to live. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus condemned hypocrisy. Look at verses uh, 27 and 28 in Matthew 23. It says, the slaves of the landowner, verse 27 and 28, it says, the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, do you not, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? 
Oh, wait, I read the wrong one. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 23. That's the one I wanted to read. Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28. This is when Jesus uh, condemned hypocrisy. Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which are on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. So you, too, outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's the verse I was trying to read to you. In the same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy means you got an evil heart, but you're trying to fool the world that you are a righteous and holy living person. I have another story. The story is told about a little boy who found a rat in his backyard, and he jumped on it, he stomped on it, he killed it. And he was so proud of himself, he ran inside to show his mother. But he didn't realize that the preacher had come to call. So the excited boy ran into the house, carrying the rat by the tail, hollering to his mom, Look at what I found. I found this rat. I jumped on it. I stomped on it. And just then he noticed that the preacher there sitting, he said, and he finished like this, and then the Lord called him home. <laughs> called him home. It's a t it's terrible to have to remember to change your behavior when you're in the presence of certain people. It's hypocrisy. We should be the same no matter where we're at. Didn't Paul say whether I'm with you or absent from you? I pray that you are living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And sometimes we naturally do this. We used to call it mind your manners when you'd go visit somebody. But you remember your parents, before you went into someone's house, we heard a list of things that you were told not to do or not to talk about or do not share and how to act. We're talking totally deeper here, though, as far as a lifestyle that totally tries to fool those around that you want to impress. And the one we really should impress is the Lord who is with us at all times. That's how our life should be truly lived. We used to call that minding your manners. But actually, a lot of times, it was our kids that got us into trouble at times because they would share something that we didn't want maybe the people we were visiting to know about, right? And they are so innocent, and they just say it how it is. And so you would... Don't be talking about this. Don't mention that. And just go in, sit down, and be quiet. And before long, something would get spilt. And it's a dangerous life. But we're talking a way deeper thing here. We're talking about our spiritual salvation. Because we're talking about falsely living, thinking we're going to be saved, but yet we're bundled up and we're thrown into a fire if you're trying to live a life of a hypocrite. But if we just live righteously and do what the Lord's asked us to do, we'll be that pure wheat and have that pure heart. And there's another lesson Jesus gives that we must learn. It is that it is his job to do the judging. And it's not our responsibility to judge and uproot. We have a, a long life. And God is very patient. And he waited until the end of maturity. Before he even harvested it. But he gave it a full chance, clear to the end, right? And I want to share this. Judging is writing a person's salvation off. 
We're not called to do that. We're called to share the gospel, the truth, the hope of Christ. And he also sent, he didn't send in the slaves, he sent in the harvesters, and they are professionals. And they could distinguish. It wasn't the slaves that he sent in. He said, I'll have the harvesters separate them. God's got a plan. He knows what he's doing. Let both grow until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters first to collect the weeds, tie them into bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. That's in Matthew 13, 29 and 30. In other words, Jesus is saying, your job is not to judge the hypocrites. I've never commissioned you to do that. And that's where I believe this is dealing with salvation. This is the salvation of people, not just their lifestyles. We do have to keep the church pure. There is reproof. There is correction to keep the church pure. But it should always have reconciliation attached to it and love. And sometimes that takes place. This is not that. This is at the end. This is the harvest Those who received Jesus and those who rejected Jesus. That's God's job, not ours. God never put us in the judgment throne to say that this person is lost, this one is saved. My responsibility is to do my best to present the truth that is in God's word and leave the rest up to God. And secondly, only God knows the person's motives. We don't know, only God knows the circumstances and why they do what they do. We don't know their background, their emotions, what's going on on the inside. God knows, so leave that to God's hands because he's the one that instructed when to do the harvest. Our job is to share the the gospel. Let the Holy Spirit do its work with conviction and wooing that person to come unto the truth. There are things, however, that we should judge. The first one is the Bible clearly teaches that we are to recognize and judge false teachings. We can do that. Matthew uh, 7, verses 15 and 16, if anyone wants to put that up. It says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly ferocious wolves. But their fruit, you will recognize them. See a parallel there? They're hypocrite teachers. There's a parallel. They are appearing to be one way, and teaching another. And we can judge that by their fruit. What are they producing? Jesus says the false teachers may look like sheep, sound like sheep, act like sheep, but they're ferocious wolves. So how do we recognize? Jesus says we recognize them by their fruit. If they are sowing seeds of discord and bitterness in their teachings, If they are causing people to become disobedient, then they are false teachers. And so we are to judge that and be very careful because there are some false teaching going on. Another thing is that we need to be very careful when we judge. Because if someone who isn't a Christian wants to come into the church truly seeking the help of the Lord, repentful, admitting, and confessing and wanting truth, they need to be able to come. Amen? We can't stop them at the door. We've got to allow them, if they're seeking, if they're looking, if they're repentful, and they're looking for the truth, we have to allow them to hear it. And that's what the church is for. That's how you came. 
There was things in your life. There was things, but you were, you were seeking. And there should be evidence of sanctification, which is a change in life after repentance. They've walked away. Repentance means walk away from a life that is un, unholy, unpure. But once you become a Christian, once you've been forgiven, that changes that standard. It has to stay pure. We need to stay pure. And that's why the Lord has given us that opportunity. We can confess our sins, and he is faithful to forgive us. Paul said this in Acts chapter 26, and this is how we are to preach. Paul said, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. Acts 26, verse 20. We allow the Holy Spirit to bring that person in, and to that point, they either reject it or they receive it. We need to have integrity within our church, though. We have to have purity. Because it carries the gospel so much further. Why should we be genuine in our faith and true? Why should we want to be authentic and not hypocritical? Because it sends a clear message. The Lord's word changes lives. It sends a clear message that the word is powerful. Really, the Bible gives us it gives us instructions to judge. But you know who it gives us instructions to judge? Ourselves. Ourselves. There's a scripture in Acts that says, judge yourself and see whether you're of the faith or not. It's hard enough just keeping it tune with our own lives sometimes. Whether you're of the faith or not, that alone really should keep us busy. Just watching ourselves. Keeping our own lives pure and genuine. Because when it's pure and genuine, our lives, that's a life that definitely witnesses what God can do when he's honored, when he's respected, when he's worshipped. That reaches people. There are always those who mock and demean the Christian life. And Matthew 13, verse 43 says, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Do you shine as a Christian? When we shine like a Christian, when we shine like the life of Jesus, it glorifies God and it spreads the gospel. We have to be authentic. We have to be pure. We need to keep the church pure. Back in the 50s, there were three young men who were rising to the top as evangelists in the evangelical circle. All three were doing well. Two of them were especially outstanding, and those who knew them anticipated these two to be some of the greatest evangelists in the future that our country might see. But those particular two soon dropped out by the wayside. One became addicted. The other actually took his own life. But the third one, the one who seemed the least promising compared to the other two at the time, remained steadfast and true and pure, and God used him in a great way. Some critics tried to their best to find anything that would show him to be less than genuine in his commitment to Christ, but they failed. He gained the respect of the people that he earned in North Carolina, a freeway named after him. And you probably know who I'm talking about. The third evangelist was Billy Graham. Billy Graham's witness for Christ 
and the respect he earned is greater than than we've seen in many years, all because of his genuine, steadfast, true. If you read some of the things that Billy Graham even started, he constant his constant preaching from only the Bible, his financial integrity was used as a model. He allowed his finances to be looked at, and it was amazing. Uh, <clears throat> his transparency around the opposite sex. He would never be alone in the presence of a woman other than his wife. He kept very humble in his attitude, even though he was very famous, and never claimed or self-elevated himself in his accomplishments. When you heard his interviews, he acted as shocked hearing some things that they would mention as he was when he first heard about it. I mean, he just was very humble. I have this. thought I'd share it. Edgar Geist wrote this. He said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than me merely tell me the way. The eyes, the eyes of better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples are always clear. I may not understand the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. And I think that's really something that we should think about is our lives speak. We can, we can talk all we want, but it's those actions. It's those actions, whether we're in front of each other or away from each other that really tell the story are we true and blue to Jesus our greatest example is our purity out in the world in the Bible a long time ago the Apostle Paul wrote this chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 therefore God exalted him to the highest place gave him the name that is above every name that at that name Jesus every knee would bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now listen to this, what I found out. I read, let me try to read it right. I read, the one thing that a wheat farmer learns early on is that when harvest time comes, the real healthy wheat is so heavy with grain that the whole plant bows. In contrast, weeds never bow. They never bow. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess so that you can bow now or you can bow later. What will it be? Are you going to pretend or are you going to truly give your life and live pure and holy for Jesus? Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that I explain that the best way possible. Lord, we need to be pure and holy until our maturity, until you call us. We're to live for you and no one else. We're to do that even amongst this evil world sometimes that is so hard, harsh. We're to stay pure, holy, and giving you praise and the glory for it. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Don't forget, next weekend... camp out. So if you show up here, the parking lot will probably be empty. You can still make it. If you came at 10, you'll get out there by 11. Oh, yes, we've got to do communion. Sorry. I stayed up too late last night. If I could have a man come forward for offering time, or offering time.
for communion, I'm sorry.